So we have a couple of things to discuss today, uh, and I will start with a little bit of a digression into the coding style and to a motivation of why we have the, today's lecture. Um, so today's lecture will be focusing on structures, uh, which is a little bit of an abstract concept, uh, but it's kind of good to have a little bit of an insight of what I mean and what I expect you to sort of try to, uh, to train yourself in, okay? And to motivate it, I um, I actually looked at the uh, at some of your labs, and I kind of extracted some of the code, uh, and we will discuss it a little bit. Uh, I think we should do it more. Uh, I think we should do a little bit more code review of the existing labs, uh, and I will prepare more material after Easter. Uh, but just to refresh, uh, when we write code. Um, we don't write code for the compiler. Of course, we write code for the compiler, but that's not the primary goal. The primary goal is to write the code for another human being to read it. Um, and of course, we're not sacrificing the uh, efficiency or the performance, but at the same time, we want something that is re really easy to follow, really easy to understand, and really easy to maintain, and really easy to extend or to, uh, to uh, update. And if there are problems, if there are bugs, it's kind of easy to fix. Um, if the code is complicated, if we're repeating the code, and if we write longer code than necessary, uh, if we use uh, uh, wrong naming conventions, everything becomes hard. Uh, maintenance becomes hard, fixing problems beca becomes hard, extending new functionality becomes hard, and we should not do that, right? So we should kind of uh, favor a clear code um, and also try to, to, to make our code kind of nice and um, uh, and following those uh, those principles. So don't repeat ourselves, easy to follow and understand, focus on readability and communicating with another human being. It can be you. So you might be reading your own code like in a couple of weeks and then you will be angry at yourself that you know you did something certain way that it makes your life now hard, right? You all, I'm sure you all had this kind of uh, <laughs> situations, right? You said, why did I do it this way, right? Uh, I have it all the time. I always go back to my codes like why I'm doing it this way or what I was thinking, right? Um, so then we have some refactoring to do. So as we discussed last week, um, there is a lot of transformations which the compiler pipeline is doing for our source code. And we should really prioritize readability and logical structure of our code and all the kind of fine-tuned optimizations most of the time are out of our hands anyway, right? Um, we should not write stupid code uh, and we should not make inefficient uh, decisions in the algorithms, uh, but you know that's given. Um, so the, the goal is to have code which is kind of uh, nice and maintainable. So let's have a look into one of the lab's um, implementations. We have um, this uh, interstellar message decoding and we have to do a couple of things. So if you don't remember or if you didn't do the lab, what is this code doing? Is this code uh, readable? Can you follow what the what the algorithm is, what, what we are doing? Uh, I think it is. Um, so we basically have some sort of um, numbers which we um, split into words and then you know map into a list of numbers. And it, this line is quite easy to follow. Um, and then we're finding a unique minimum with some text from these numbers and we're finding unique maximum. Um, and it seems that if something goes wrong, we will be kind of uh, on the unhappy path, right? So it seems because we are doing this do within this either monadic context, we have a happy and unhappy path. So the happy path kind of does what it does and the unhappy path kicks us out into the left side of the equation, right? So you can kind of see that uh, probably this function will kick out some error with minimum. Uh, this function will kick out some error with maximum. And then once we have those two passed, we, we have the minimum and, and maximum unique. We're doing the sum, we're checking if the sum is even. And then if it, if it is even, we counting how many of those um, midpoints we have in the numbers. Okay, looks good. What do you think? 
I think it looks quite good. Um, there are some things which I don't like. So I don't like this, uh, this thing here, right? I'm doing some processing on the right-hand side and I'm doing some processing on the left-hand side. And when you're writing functional code, usually you compose things. So you usually you logically say, I'm doing this on this data and this can be a composition of functions, right? So I would rather have this being composed a little bit differently, a little bit more logically, right? Uh, the same is this line. I don't like this line either. Uh, why are we using twice this dollar sign, right? Usually we use it at the end to, to, to kind of avoid the, the brackets and the argument. Then we use the dollar sign, but this feels a bit smelly, right? It, it's, it's not that great. So I refactored it, okay? So this is the refactored code. And now those two lines read, read better. So I have a composition. So I'm kind of uh, splitting into words and then mapping them into the, the numbers. And this is the argument. It's kind of a more logical now. It's clear, clearer to follow. And it's the same here. I, I can see that I'm sort of uh, filtering all the midpoints uh, divided by two. Uh, I'm calculating the length and uh, wrapping it into the happy path into the right side of either, and then numbers is the argument, right? So I'm, I'm doing all this processing on this argument. So this code is a little bit improved. It's a, the readability is a little bit better, right? Um, but overall, the code is not too bad, right? So now, this is kind of a social construct. It's not me deciding whether that is a good code or bad code. It's actually us as a group deciding is it's a good code or not, right? Um, I cannot, as a teacher, say uh, this code is um, bad because I say so. Uh, everybody has a certain uh, perspective and certain uh, subjective metrics, and there are some objective metrics, right? So one of the objective metrics is how long this code is, how much reading do we need to do? That's an objective metric, right? The other metric is how nested this code is. That's another objective metric, right? Um, so even though it is a socially constructed perspective of the which code is smelly and which code is clean, uh, there is not much difference between those two. The number of lines is the same, the indentation is the same, but we are saying this way of expressing things is a little bit better than this way with the dollar signs sprinkled along the lines, right? You may disagree, you may feel like, I actually like this more because it says do this, uh, and then pass it to here and then so on, right? But that's not really how Haskell works. Like it, it is sort of uh, most people in Haskell would say this is cleaner than the other one, right? But it's a little bit more difficult to objectively say why, okay? I tried to uh, to identify why. And one thing that I was thinking of is that space, which is a function application in Haskell is the most useful thing, right? So we're using space to apply arguments to a function. And that's what we use a lot. So then you can compose things by calling function with another function. And again, you use space, right? So then the next step further is the um, function composition. And we use dot for that. We're composing more complex functions by combining simpler functions. And that's the dot, right? And the dollar sign is really uh, a syntactic sugar to avoid, like you see, if I put bracket here and here, I don't need this dollar sign. It, it, it just makes it this into a single function. And then this is the argument of that function if I wrap it in the bracket. So the dollar, dollar sign here is just a syntactic sugar to avoid the double uh, brackets at the beginning at the end of this, of this thing here, right? Would you prefer to have brackets with the argument or do you prefer the dollar? That is completely subjective, right? Um, you may say, yeah, you know, dollar is just one character, brackets are two characters, and you have to keep track of the closing bracket of the beginning of the bracket. It's more mental work to, to work with brackets than to work with this dollar, right? But it's a bit nuanced. So you see there is a spectrum. Some things are objectively bad and smelly. Some things are subject to interpretation. You may have a personal 
argument why something is preferred than something else, right? Um, so again, in the portfolio, you may say, I did it this way because, and then if you have an argument, fair enough, right? I will not argue with you. So I, I'm not an authority saying that, you know, you have to use the dollar sign here instead of brackets. I've seen code people using brackets and I've seen code people using the dollar sign, right? Um, I feel BOVA, okay, that there is no huge difference. I prefer a little bit this because as I said, a mental workload on the tracking of the brackets is a little bit more work than just seeing this, right? Uh, this one is kind of a simpler to read. All right, so how about this code? It is exactly the same code. It does exactly the same thing. Do you like this code? Do you think it's a good code? No, it's not. Objectively speaking, it's a bit of nightmare, right? Like, shit, <laughs> what's going on, right? Uh, what is actually happening? Like, it will take you minutes to really fully understand what's going on. And there is a lot of repetitions. We're doing the minimum nums uh, a lot of times. Uh, we're repeating ourselves in multiple lines and we quitting in multiple places, right? So there is a quit here, quit here, quit here, quit here, quit here, right? You have to keep track of the, of the control flow of where we are quitting, uh, like out of the processing uh, and when we are continuing processing. So the, the happy path is littered with the unhappy quits, right? Uh, this code is very similar to writing Golang code where you have this if nil is different than, uh, if error is different than nil. So our happy path is littered with all those checks that something went wrong, right? Th this code is very similar to that, right? Okay, so this is a very common pattern of uh, people using and it has uh, a name. It's, a, it's called Pyramid of Doom. <laughs> And I actually checked, there is a Pyramid of Doom. Uh, no, um, no, it, not, not Pyramid of Doom. There, there's a, a, a website called uh, callbackhell.com, um, <laughs> which explains this thing. So it, it is kind of a known phenomenon of code, which looks kind of like this, right? Um, and it has been used in some programming humor and it's something that we have to avoid, right? We don't want to write code like this. Uh, we have to think how we can structure the code into not having the pyramid of doom. Um, so um, how we can do that? Well, we can do that by taking advantage of the language that we have. And sometimes we try to flatten the processing. So uh, this one uh, doesn't have the uh, pyramid of doom. It has the kind of a one extra happy and unhappy path at the end. Um, but all the intermediate processing is nicely wrapped into functions which return either, and they kind of help us to contain the quitting of the unhappy path with the kind of a nice properties of the language which we have here. In, 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 in Haskell, you can do this. In Rust, you would do very similar thing with the question mark or uh, at the end of some of your functions. So if the functions was returning an error or kind of returning an unhappy path, you would quit and you would kind of go here. But if it was a happy path, your code would kind of look the same, right? You would not have this um, um, nightmare of doom in, um, in the Rust neither if you don't want to, right? You can, you can write this type of style in every programming language. All, all programming languages have if statements and you can write code like this but you should not, right? Um, all right, so then some lessons learned. Um, we not write code with complicated nesting of control structure. We try to flatten it. Um, and then how we can flatten it? Well, that's what this lecture is about. This lecture is about the structure. Uh, so the, the beauty of this, uh, on the surface level is to use the do notation. I use monadic either and kind of have monadic functions which kind of uh, return you the, the monadic state, but there is a little bit more involved. Like you actually have to imagine it first and then you can code it this way, right? Um, so what we do is we try, whoops, uh, we try to focus on 
what we need to achieve and what is the kind of the best structure to achieve it? Like what would be the, the, the most concise and beautiful structure to achieve what we need? And in Haskell, you use do notation and in Rust, you use the result with the syntactic sugar of the question mark, which helps you to kind of uh, make some of the if statements uh, unnecessary, right? How would you do that in Golang? It's like, no, you cannot, right? In Golang, you sort of, uh, uh, you're not really doomed to the kind of a, a pyramid of doom, but you're doomed into this kind of uh, splitting your happy path with littered uh, checks for the unhappy path, right? Um, so that some languages have limitations, but with languages like Rust and Haskell, you don't have those limitations. So you should try to do it properly. Uh, the pyramid of doom is, is very typical use case for asynchronous programming and for co uh, com um, uh, programming with callbacks. So if you ever did anything with Node.js, where you have to say, do this, and when you finish, do either this or that depending on the error and then when you do this do this blah 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 you you're getting into this type of a pyramid of doom right so you say uh fetch the credentials from the user and then if the credentials are correct try to uh, establish a connection to the database and if the connection is connect co correct do this and so on and you kind of nesting and nesting all, all your kind of callbacks um so nesting callbacks often leads to the pyramid of doom. And as I said, there is this website, um, callbackhell.com, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it basically des describes it with JavaScript of why it is a problem and like what you should do to avoid it. And it's quite good. Like, um, so uh, check it out. Um, in JavaScript uh, and Node.js, um, you do have certain libraries that you can use to flatten it. Uh, and then in Kotlin and Haskell, you have a very nice functionality to allow you to do this. And both Kotlin and Haskell, and to some extent Rust, they use kind of an imperative style of programming asynchronously, such that you actually don't need this very complicated kind of a nested, um, nested structure. Uh, so you can avoid this pyramid of doom. Um, the good thing is um, you're going to learn Kotlin next semester and you're going to try out this type of programming with uh, async uh, libraries and with the um, uh, the, the um, um, yeah, coroutines. So they have a special model for programming asynchronous code based on some uh, thread pools and they call them coroutines. And the coroutines have this kind of a nice property that you can actually structure your asynchronous calls as if it was um, kind of imperative style. Uh, and the unhappy path is treated separately, right? So that's what you kind of gain. Um, with languages like uh, JavaScript and Node.js where happy and unhappy path are kind of uh, intermingled together, then you end up with this kind of a bad, bad designs, bad code. All right, so then um, a little bit on, on Haskell functions. Um, it's an extremely powerful mechanism. Um, and most of you don't take advantage of what you have at your disposal. Um, Rust is also quite good. Rust has many functional features that allow you to have a very nice concise code. Uh, and sometimes all you need is like a turn around your original way of thinking kind of a back to front. And suddenly the solution is much nicer, okay? So I have a little bit contrived example here just to, to give you a little bit of thinking. Um, but the idea is that um, sometimes our normal imperative way of thinking of like do this, get the result here, do this, get a result here, and then combine it to do this is, is good. But sometimes you kind of need to do like a little bit like upside down to see that it's much simpler if you do it slightly differently, right? So let's have a very quick uh, run through of some of the Haskell uh, features. And that's what I like about Haskell the most. Uh, it doesn't constrain my expressiveness of how I think about the problem into how I would like to express it. Whereas languages, even languages like Rust, they do constrain me because some things 
cannot be done. Uh, in Haskell, almost everything you can think of can be done. Uh, but in, 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 in Rust, it, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, so a very simple, a very simple start. Let's let's have a go. I I don't remember the time, but th those questions should be really fast. So what is this? It's trivial, right? We have a function plus, and it's written in the infix notation, and it has a left-hand side argument and a right-hand side argument, and it evaluates to five, okay? So, so simple. All languages have it, okay? All right, so now look at this. What's that? It's the same but I carried my plus function with two, right? Uh, and it's so easy. Like uh, it's, it's actually trivial in Haskell, right? Try to do it that in Rust. Try to carry a function in Rust. Okay, you can, but it's not as easy. You will type a lot of code to, to achieve that, right? Here it's like super trivial. Again, it's five. Again, it's a, a function, but this time it's a one argument function because I already made the two argument function into a one argument function, and I'm passing it three as the missing argument, right? This three goes on the left or right hand side? Left hand side, because I have two on the right hand side, right? I can as easily do it the, the other way around. If it was division, it would matter. For plus, it doesn't matter, right? But it's so trivial, right? Okay, next one. Ooh, the magic dollar sign. Uh, what is this? Again, it's trivial. It's the same as the before one. It's just that uh, I injected the dollar sign in, 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 in between, right? But the dollar sign is a function, actually. It's an infix, infix function, which takes right-hand side and left-hand side, right? Um, and... It, what it does, it evaluates this first and then gives it to this side, right? Um, it doesn't change, it's like if you remove it, it, it's exactly the same, but I just injected additional function in the middle, right? But what does it give me? Well, how about this? Again, it's exactly the same. I just uh, extracted the infix function now to be in the prefix notation. So the dollar sign now is the first, which is the function what, what I'm doing uh, from the infix. And then I have a left-hand side argument being this. Uh, so my left-hand side argument to the dollar sign is this, and my right-hand side argument is this, right? Again, it's super trivial. Uh, Try to do that in, in Rust. You, you can't, you, you start getting like, okay, that makes no sense in Rust anymore, right? Uh, all right, so one more. So now I do this. What's that? Again, it's exactly the same, but now I twist, turned around the arguments. Now I have the function at the end, right? And I have the value being kind of the first argument uh, because I flip the arguments for the dollar sign. So again, it's exactly the same, but now what I can do is I can carry that part and pass it into some form of a callback that actually is doing something with the value that I have here. You see that? Um, so it kind of gives you the flexibility 
of what needs to be processed first, what needs to be processed later, and how I'm passing arguments around. And it's like super flexible. It, it offers a kind of infinite possibilities of, of combining things. Uh, because sometimes you need to do calculate the value and then pass it to something that you need to do something later. And that's what it, this allows me. Like this first part is a function which takes the value and then applies it to, to a function which is actually given as an argument, right? Um, so the, the beauty of uh, functional programming is that the functions are first uh, class entities and you can pass them around and you can achieve a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of patterns that in object-oriented programming requires those kind of uh, boilerplate code. Uh, here, you, you, you're just flexible. Um, so one more. Just for checking you guys out. So now I tried to compose the dollar sign with the flip. Can I do that? Does it make sense? No, it sort of doesn't make sense because why it doesn't make sense? How many arguments dollar sign takes? Two, left-hand side and right-hand side, right? How many arguments flip takes? It takes three because it takes a function and the left-hand side argument and the right-hand side argument, and it applies them in the opposite way. So it flips the left-hand side with right-hand side. So flip takes three arguments, dollar sign takes two arguments. So you already see, oh, okay, we probably dot is not gonna cut it, right? Because dot works well to combine functions which takes kind of the same number of arguments. Otherwise you get into problems, right? Because you have a hanging something or missing something. So that is a compiler error. So this one is fine with, with space because we applying flip to this function with this argument and this argument, you see flip takes three arguments, but this one is a compiler error because how many arguments should that function take? Well, be, by the nature of, of, of dollar sign, it takes two arguments, but by the nature of flip, it should take three. So it, 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 it cannot compile, right? Should you ask ChatGPT to tell you this? If you don't see it, you could, but you would be really inefficient, right? If you're checking somebody else's code, reading something, uh, and if you have to ask ChatGPT to explain it to you, your, your workflow gets really disrupted, right? Uh, and if you see it, like same as you sort of see, you know, um, that this is five with the same ease, your workflow will be kind of uh, much better. So reading code and um, trying to sort of mentally do this mental debugging will train you. You will become kind of be better at it, right? And you will not need to ask ChatGPT to, to kind of uh, fix things for you or, or explain things to you. All right, so this this is a hard topic. Um, it that that's what makes um, that's what makes Haskell also kind of a hard programming language. It's not the syntax. Actually, the syntax is super easy. Like, you know, space and dot and and dollar sign most of the time, right? <laughs> uh, but the concepts are kind of hard, and the concepts we do have them in other programming languages. Like, for example, in collections you know the concept of a vector or a list or a set. Uh, we do have containers, uh, but in imperative programming, we almost exclusively use it for data. We almost exclusively use it for values. Uh, whereas here, we use it for values the same way, but we also use it for structuring the computation itself, for the processing. And that is the next step, like the next step in understanding what the, those structures are. And we have more structures here, right? So in do we have functors and uh, applicatives in other programming languages? Yeah, we do actually. We do have monads also in, in Rust, 
uh, and we use certain syntactic sugar for exploiting some of the properties. Uh, so you learn it by, by syntax and by those question marks or things like this, but you cannot really create them yourself. Like you, you have been given them and you sort of can use them in certain uh, situations, but you cannot create your own. Uh, whereas here you, you actually are given the power of, of creating your own if you want to, or applying your own one to your problems. Uh, so you have much more, um, much more power. So what this lecture is about is to give you some intuitions. Uh, and this is kind of hard because everybody works slightly differently. Everybody conceptualizes those things a little bit differently. And yeah, I don't know, like if you will have some good analogies or some good explanations for some of those things, please share. Uh, so I will try my best to give you those intuitions. But as I'm saying, I may fail, right? I, I may not convey what, what I'm trying to convey. Um, so let's have a, let, let's start with the, again, with a very simple use case. So if you see this, if you see, what, what is this? It's an empty list. What do you think? What, what is it? Can you um, uh, take multiple things or can you take only one thing? Yeah, so well, that sucks. So of course it's a list. And if you, if you look at it, it's a list, okay? If, if it was Golang, it's a list and pretty much that's it. <laughs> Uh, you do have a little bit of a functor functionality in Golang, but mm, yeah. However, if you look at it from Haskell perspective or, or uh, also from Rust, it's all those things. It's a semi-group, it's a functor, it's an applicative functor, it's a monad, and you can use it in those contexts. You can use it as that shape, right? So all those things give you a certain um, power, certain properties that you can exploit. Um, and of course, it is a list. All right, so let's do a next one. Maybe, or option, option from uh, Rust and maybe from uh, Haskell. You don't have it in Golang. What is it? So most of you will probably make it wrong. Um, so there are a couple of distractors. But, but oh, I see, I see. Ah, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, so it normally it should quit here as well. Yeah, anyway, that's what I said. So uh, some of you did wrong because maybe is not a type, strictly speaking. Why? Why maybe is not a type? But it is a semi-group, it's a functor, it's an applicative functor, and it's a monad. Um, but maybe is not a type in itself, like if I if I set, have it like this, okay? So I will, all right, so um, what's the difference between maybe and maybe hint? What is this and what is this? And we also have, we can say maybe A. Is there a difference between this and this? There is a difference. This is a type constructor. It's a generic type, which constructs a concrete type. This is a type, but this is not a type. This is a one level above a type, right? Uh, in C++ or in Golang, we don't have that ability to go one level up. In Haskell, we do. So in, in C++ or, uh, you know, um, uh, Golang, we are here and that's it. We don't cannot go there. In Rust, we can to some extent because of the traits. Uh, we can say some, we can kind of 
go a little bit up, not to that level, but a little bit above the normal pipes. Um, so there is this kind of a traits uh, in, in, in Rust, which allows us to, to reason a little bit above the primitive types or kind of a concrete types. So pay attention that this or this are different to this. Uh, I cannot instantiate an instance of maybe, but I can of maybe int, right? So that means this is a type because the type can be instantiated into some object or value, uh, but this cannot. This can only be instantiated into a type, right? All right. Um, so one intuition is that the structure is some sort of value in, in some context. Um, and the, the easiest context that we can have is um, is list. So what is this now? Is it a type? Is it a type constructor or is it the data constructor? So what, what's the difference? So here we have a concept of a type constructor. And here we have a concept of the data constructor. So uh, a normal constructor in C++ lives in this space because when we call the constructor, we construct an instance of a particular type, right? But in this level, if we call a constructor on the type, we create an instance of a particular type. Um, so it's kind of a one, one level up. So here, this is not the type in itself because it, it lives here, uh, but it is a type constructor, but it is also a data constructor, right? Uh, it, it fulfills both of those roles. We use the same syntax on this level and on this level. All right, so most people got that right. That's good. So if you give it a concrete type, it will create us uh, a concrete uh, concrete type. So it's a type constructor because it can create a list of ints, for example, right? So given a, a concrete type, it will create us a, um, an instantiation of that type. Um, and also it is an empty list, right? So it, it is also a literal representing an empty list. Uh, what type that empty list is then? Yeah. Nil. Nil. What does that mean? Like nothing, not nothing. <laughs> Any other ideas? Huh? Generic. That's better. Uh, it's. Uh, we don't know if this is an empty list of ints or empty list of strings or empty list of whatever, right? Uh, because it's a generic type. It's like a, it's a generic polymorphic value that could mean those different things, right? Um, and that is, a, again, a very important concept. Like if I write 42, what is that? Yeah, the answer to the universe, but what else is that? <laughs> well, it's a number, and in most programming languages, it has a fixed type. It's an int, right? Most programming languages would look at it and say, yeah, it's a literal for an integer value of 42. But if you look at it from Haskell perspective, you actually don't know. It could be a float. It could be a big integer. It could be, you know, it's a polymorphic value, right? It can be of any of those types. It is restricted to numbers. You know it's a number. Uh, it cannot be a string, but you don't know what type it is, right? It can fulfill any any type that you need. Again, that gives you a bit of a power. So in languages like Rust, you don't have it. In languages like Rust that literals are not polymorphic, they have one specific type, uh, but in languages like Haskell, they are. And that, that gives you a little bit more expressive power. So it is a concrete, um, is an empty list. Uh, it is a concrete value, but it has a polymorphic value, right? Um, so polymorphic uh, is a concept that you need to know. 
uh, and you already know it from C++, right? You, you learned about polymorphic functions in the context of object hierarchy. And if you're calling a function, you don't know if it will be called on the parent or on the child because the function is polymorphic. Depending who is the um, callee, that behavior will be executed, right? Uh, so you're calling the same function, but you get potentially different behaviors, right? Uh, so you already learned about polymorphic functions and we have those polymorphic functions in uh, other languages too. And now we, we know that you can also have polymorphic um, literals, right? There is a question. Right, right, right. So the let me just quickly change the video. Yeah, sorry. So that there is not much on the on the whiteboard. It's just that maybe int is different to maybe or maybe a. Uh, that the, that that we have those two levels. We have the kind of um type class level and then type level, or or traits and types in, in Rust. So polymorphic. Uh, already gives you some ability to express certain things in a in a nicer way. So it's a it's your toolbox, right? Uh, you can use it uh, to structure your problems in a kind of a, a nice and co concise way. All right. So we covered lists. So one more, maybe. What is maybe? Is it a type? No, we know it's not. Is it a type constructor or is it a data constructor, or both? It is a type constructor uh, because given a concrete type, it will create us a new concrete type. Um, it is not a data constructor. There is uh, another question. What are data constructors in, in maybe? So nothing is one of them. So nothing uh, is one data constructor for maybe. It creates an instance of maybe, which is polymorphic because it fits any other concrete types of maybes, right? And the other one is what? Just, exactly. So just takes a value and creates us a, 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 a value of maybe type of whatever that the, the a concrete maybe type is. So we have two data constructors are nothing and just. All right, let's have a short break. Um, so I will do a timer. Let's say seven minutes, recharge batteries. All right, so let's continue. Um, where is my here? All right, so what we will do now is we will kind of uh, use one of the structures, uh, the, the with the example of maybe of trying to see how we are kind of uh, doing processing with things in structure, right? Um, so that's the, the most simple one. Um, so we have, we have to multiply something and that something is already in a structure, right? Um, why do we use the, the maybe structure or option structure? Well, the, the basic use case is to deal with happy and unhappy paths, right? Uh, in a clear and very concise way. So instead of having a lot of if statements of something goes wrong, we use maybe or option in Rust to make it kind of easy uh, to deal with those things, right? Uh, and have very linear happy path and then unhappy path kind of shortcuts to nothing. Um, so 
the question was like how to apply this function to this value. And the answer is we use fmap, right? We um, we treat this as a functor and functors allow us to kind of uh, map a function inside the structure, right? Um, very simple. Uh, some languages have something like a map or fmap um, and then you can sort of use it. Uh, most often for collections, right? So e even Golang has that for collections, uh, I think. Um, I don't remember actually, to be honest, uh, but most languages do have kind of a facility to do mapping over values inside um, some sort of container. Um, so here we used a container being the option or, or uh, maybe in this case, maybe number. All right, so one more. How would you do that for values in a list? Same way, right? Uh, you can map the function over values in a, um, in a container and the container this time is a list. And again, it's a functor because we can map something over that, that, that functor. Um, and for lists, fmap is exactly the same as map. So map is the implementation of fmap for, for lists, right? All right, so that's the correct answer. Some people got it right. Um, yeah, this is also a correct answer. Map is fine. Um, I don't know why this was not marked as a correct answer. Ah, yeah, because uh, there is maybe space missing or something. Yeah, Th this is a correct answer. This is a correct answer. No, this is not a correct answer because you have the function inside the container. So the function needs to be plain, plain function, not in the container, right? Yeah, I don't know, it doesn't work too well. Like this is fine, but this this is the same. Oh yeah, there is an extra space. So maybe because of this extra space here, but it is correct. All right, anyway, let's move on. So that is an example of a functor, right? So a structure that allows us to apply a normal ordinary function over a value inside the structure, right? Um, yes, it sounds a bit fancy, but like practically speaking, every time you're dealing with the happy and unhappy path and you want to do some cons consecutive processing and you don't want to litter it with if statements, you would use this because then you can kind of a shortcut to the unhappy path, right? Um, all right, so one more. So now we have function in the structure and value in the structure, how we can apply them together. So we have a function inside the structure and we have a value inside the structure and the structure is the same. It's some sort of a maybe structure <laughs> or option. So how would that work? What you can use here? Again, that's kind of the typical use case for an applicative functor. So we have a separate kind of apply function in infix notation, which takes the function in a structure on the left-hand side and a value in the structure on the right-hand side, and you can do it. So some of you did it, uh, did it fine. Uh, you cannot use space. So if you try to apply this function to this value, uh, that would be a compiler error here. Um, it is an applicative functor, correct? And you cannot use fmap. Um, fmap you can use for the plain function, but not for the function inside the structure, right? So here we have an example of an applicative functor, which allows us, which gives us a bit more power. Now we can contain our functionality in a box and have a value in a box, right? Um, so now we have a little bit more extra. All right, so let's have a look. What comes next? So we have 
ability to do uh, simple things like this. We have to multiply number of values by two and then add 10 to them. And those operations can be organized into a box and the values can be organized into a box and we can achieve it in a single operation, right? So if I have two things to do on all of those values, I have a very trivial way of solving it uh, because I already have the machinery to do it. So we just do this apply because the box is the same. I have a list and here I have a list. List is an applicative functor and I can apply all those functions to all those values. And it works like this function is applied here, this function is applied there, and then this function is applied here and this function is applied there. And that, that, that generates four values for me, right? And it is with this, um, yeah, this is a correct, um, correct answer. But again, because of the space, the stupid uh, Mentimeter treats as uh, different to the default correct answer. So there is a space here. I don't think I can uh, say uh, ignore white space, but in Inspera exam, it, it is true. Like the white space is ignored. So th those will be both correct answers. All right, let's move on. So how about this one? Can I do that? Of course I can do that. That the whole point is to a, enable me to do it, right? That's how we deal with the unhappy path. Uh, such that at some point something becomes nothing and then nothing bad happens and we kind of uh, shortcut the processing, right? Um, so nothing happens. <laughs> and it's the same with applicative factors in other languages. It's not the property just of Haskell. You can you can do that with uh, with Rust as well. All right, one more. How about the, what is this? It's an infix notation for fmap, right? So it's an infix for functor. Can I combine that function inside the box with this value inside the box with the functor? Well, by definitions, you probably should guess that that will not work. Um, and it will give us a compiler error saying, no, you cannot do that. If, if I don't have this inside the box, if I just have this, of course it will work, but with the, with the box, it will not work. All right, how about nothing? Will that work? Nope, it's not gonna work neither. It's the same problem. Like we have something in a box. In this case, actually we have nothing in a box, uh, but we cannot use functor. We have to use applicative, right? So you have to use applicative here. So it's the same as, as the, the previous one. Um, all right, how about this? So I, I have a functor and I have a plain function and I have this line of code. Will that work? So now I have a normal function and a functor and I'm using fmap. Unfortunately, they are on the wrong sides. 
um, because the F map takes the function on the left hand side and the value on the right hand side. And this here, this line is the opposite. So it will not work, right? The, because the arguments need to be swapped. All right. So then I have this. And that will work. That will work just fine. So this is fmap with the function on the left hand side and the value in a box in the right hand side. And that's what the, yeah, perfect. That's what we intend to achieve. And that's what we get. Fantastic. All right, one more. Yeah. Oh shit, we have uh, two boxes. We have a normal function and we have a functor inside a functor. Uh, how can we uh, do this? Will this work? It will not work, unfortunately, because um, we cannot apply multiply by two into a value in a box. Um, like this function doesn't accept boxes. It, it only accepts numbers, right? So it can be applied to a value inside a box. And is, as long as the value is a number, that would work. But our value is this, because this is the outer box. This is the inner box. And then inside the inner box, we have a value. So we are kind of at two levels deep now, right? Uh, so this will not work. So any idea how we can do this? So we have a value in a context, which is in another context. And then we need to do this operation inside this inner thing. How can we do that? The responding is off, okay. Why responding is off? Okay, now can you respond? Yeah, so can you can you try? Yeah, that's a that's a clever way. Uh, so basically we have to lift it to a box which will be on the level of our um, inner box and then we can map it to the value of the inner box and then that will kind of work, right? Uh, but that will not work with the um yeah let's let's try it so let's see right so we have week so we say just plus two and we f map it to just just 10 and we make all possible combination of brackets such we are sure it's not a bracket problem and it doesn't work, right? What would work? This would almost work, but we have kind of our two things. So we have the outer box and we have the inner box. The outer box is a functor. Um, the inner box is a functor, but we also want to treat it as a applicative in this case, because we have this function in the box. So if we had, if we didn't have the outer box, that would work, right? This would work. Um, but because we have the outer box, um, it doesn't work because we are missing one level. So we, we're missing one F map, right? If we could apply this, this to the inside, then it would work, right? Um, let me see if I have the answer in the slides. I should. No, I don't. Um, so... 
Yeah, so the dollar sign is that it, it is basically F map, but in infix notation, right? F map is in the prefix notation and the dollar sign is in the infix notation. So they are exactly the same. Um, yeah, exactly. So we basically have to do this. We have to kind of map the this to get into the inside box. And then on the inside box, we have to map this over this in, in, to get into the value, right? So we kind of need to do F map twice. It's the simplest way, just treat all the both boxes as a functor, right? Um, and then we kind of chain our um, applications of F map to apply the first one to the first box and then the second to the second box. There is, um, so let's, let's call this a box. So let's call this box equals uh, our value into two structures. So just to make sure that it is what we want it is, it is there. So now I have to F map, um, F map, um, and then I am uh, using the plus two and we doing it on the box. So we um doing it like this, right? So we have um we have to chain twice the F map um uh, and then do this on the value inside the box which has the outer box. Make sense? Um so this is one way of writing it, and then the way which was written with the brackets and uh, one, two, three, one, two, three works also, right? So that is kind of the same. So we uh, have the normal function being F mapped into the inside of the box and this mapping happens on because of F map on the outside box. All right, so it's a little bit con convoluted, um, but with this with this notation, it is sort of um, uh, it, it's not too bad. So if we have three layers of nesting, you would have to chain the F map three times, right? It's like an onion. Why would this, what is, why it is useful? It is useful because uh, sometimes you want to have a happy path for some processing and you're doing it in the context of another box, which might be your IO, or you are kind of dealing with a particular happy path for a particular processing, which is in the context of another processing in another box. And that is inside the IO that you need to do. So we often in, in Haskell have this sort of uh, embedded nature of processing with the context being the inner context and outer context and even outer context. And you need to know like uh, from which level you can do something on the inside values of whatever level you are dealing with, right? Um, it's very useful if you get into uh, monad transformers and you're chaining monads together, right? Um, again, I I'm, I'm using language which may be um, a little bit uh, difficult to grasp, but if you think that you have a maybe, and then here we have to, to have a real type, right? But this real type can have a box. So we already have two, two boxes, right? Uh, same with the uh, with either. So often you have either. On this side, you have some sort of a string or an error or something on the unhappy path. But on the happy path, maybe you want to have a maybe. Right? Maybe you want to have some processing which may not actually work, not because of the error, but because of, um, I don't know, some additional things, right? Uh, so then you actually have one box, outer box, and you end up with the inner box and you need to get to the inner box, right? Um, so it, it is actually often the case that you have two or three levels of, uh, of processing to be done like this. Um, so this is, yeah, this is uh, an, another case like this, where we have, um, we have 
a box which is just, which is maybe, but we have inner box, which is a list. And now we need to multiply by two everything inside that list. How, how can you get to, how can you do this? Same, same story, right? Um, Yeah, let's let's move on. Um, I think that is more or less clear, right? You need to embed the either F maps or um, right. So now the the question is, okay, okay, we know how to do it with F map or with the infix F map. Uh, can you do that without? Can you actually achieve it without F map uh, and without um, kind of a functor? And the hint is, well. Instead of using a functor, use an applicative. Can we use the the um... <laughs> no, let's use uh, applicative. It is sometimes very helpful. So I will spoil the the fun. I will tell you the answer, and the answer is like this. Um, so there is a function called lift a, uh, which basically uh, lifts a value or a function from a base level, one level up to the box level, whatever the box is. And lift is a generic uh, polymorphic function and it will, will lift it to the box that is needed, right? Uh, so in our case, uh, the first box is maybe, uh, the inner box is a list. So this one, uh, um, the first one will kind of uh, lift this function to the to, to the F map, to the uh, level of the list as an applicative. Uh, and the other one will lift it to the level of the of the maybe, right? So by doing this, we can apply this function to this value, to this value in two boxes, right? All right. Uh, and this is an example of the actual code from last year lab where we were using SDL. Uh, and we had to um, do fmap twice often uh, because we did have values in two boxes, in the outer box and the inner box. Uh, so you see here that um, I'm getting a window size uh, via this SDL call uh, from this argument. And then I have to uh, apply from int integral uh, over the window size so you can Kind of imagine that the window size will probably have height and width. So it probably is a box of some sort with two values. And I'm converting both of them into the integral uh, or from the integral to whatever type I need. Um, and then I sort of get those two values as the uh, vector two with width and height, right? So I'm, I'm kind of doing it in some sort of a do notation. And I have to do, I have to apply kind of the from integral into the inside of the second box, right? So the first box is the outer box, which I don't care about. And then the inner box is some sort of a structure with two values, or it's probably a list, or we don't know from the code here, but we can see that this results in a value, values in two boxes, right? So it's often the case that you kind of combine, and this is also an example of a combining the infix notation with the prefix notation, right? We don't do fmap twice, like with the dot. Uh, we actually combine nicely this with this. And again, one may argue that this reads f better than the double fmap, right? Um, all right, so let's, let's try this. Let's try if you got the intuitions. Now I have uh, a function in the box and I have a value in a box. Will that work? And if that will work, what it will produce? Yeah, the, the destructors are a little bit of a hint here. <laughs> this one is I see. All right, so let's go back and forth. So 
it actually is a compiler error because the boxes are not the same. So here we have a maybe box and here we have a list box. So if we combine those two boxes together, what should we get? Should we get a plain value? Why? Why would we get suddenly value outside of the box, outside of the context? That, that's definitely wrong. Should we get a list? Um, why, if the function is in the list, but the value is in maybe, maybe we should get maybe, right? So maybe we should get this. So you don't know. So it, it is actually a compiler error, right? Um, you cannot combine by applicative functor two different boxes. They have to be the same box. Uh, then you can combine them with this operator. But if there are two different boxes, well, you know, it's a bit of a problem. Um, all right. So how about this? Function in the box and a value in the box, and they are the same box type. Will that work? Everyone voted? Oh, no, it's not voting. You have to type, right? Yeah, five is fine. Let's see, what did you type? So 12, yes, 12 is a correct answer. It will work. So it will apply this function to this value and keep it in that box. So it will be value 12 in the box, which is a list. How about this one? I have two functions in a box and a single value in a single value in the same box. Again, it will work. It will work the same way as with the fmap, right? Uh, we have, uh, no, 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 not like with fmap, but with the ap applicatives, uh, because we have functions in the box and then, um, sorry. So it will compute 12 and 20. Very good, very good answer. And this is the same, I will not wait, but it's just one function and two values. That's the same, it will work. And also the most interesting one, if you have multiple to multiple, but we've already discussed that. So this applied to this, this applied to this, and then this applied to this and this applied to that. So we already covered that. So, all right, um, how about this one? So the dollar sign is just a replacement for the brackets. So this code and this code are exactly the same. Uh, will that work and what it will produce? One person managed in time. And it is a correct answer. Congratulations. It will work uh, because we are composing a new function. Um, and this new function is a composition of two functions. One is plus two and one is just. Plus two, what plus two takes? Plus two takes a number. So this, this will be the first function to accept this 10 and do something with it. And then the result will be passed to this function. So plus two will get 10. It will do its magic, producing plus 12, uh, actually 12, positive integer. And this 12 will be passed to just, and then just will do its magic to wrap it inside a box, which produces just 12, right? So this works fine because we composing the function. If I delete this dot, then uh, I, did, I hope I don't have the, yeah, I don't have the question, but I have a slide. 
what is the type of this first line? Okay, so maybe not what is a type first. What is a value and what is a function? Is the first thing a function or is the first thing a value? Will the first thing accept an argument or the th first thing is just a value? Just the value. What is the second thing? The second thing is a function, which can accept a single argument, which needs to be a number because this function requires a number, right? So again, it's a little bit, um, yeah, when I started with Haskell, that was really pissing me off because that, that makes a huge difference, but it's just one little character and my code can be really broken because I have either missing dot or a one dot in the wrong place, right? Um, and it's like a headache, but as you read more Haskell, you will kind of uh, learn, train yourself and you will see it immediately, right? Uh, but it is uh, something that I, at least I struggled. Uh, but it this just plus 12 is just a value. It doesn't accept anything. It will do nothing. Like if you try to pass something to it, it will be a compiler problem, right? Uh, but this thing is a function. Um, all right, so then um, th that one is an interesting one. So sometimes we need to do this. Um, sometimes uh, we trying to get um, we combining two boxes, but we want to achieve a box with inside boxes, right? So this one kind of achieves that for us. Um, so it's exactly the same as before. Like when, when we only had this, it basically produces 12 and uh, 22, but now it also uh, robs uh, the values uh, inside a, another box, right? So it will not be only 12 and 22, it will be just 12 and just 22 inside the box, right? Because we this is a single function, which is applied to those two values and it produces just 12 and just 22. Can you see it? Yeah. All right, so then we have um, a magic again. Um, we have something in the box, which has an inner box and we want to uh, flip it inside out. We want to actually uh, turn it inside out to take the inside box out and the outside box in. Um, do you know how to do that? Yeah, we can try. So flip is already in the vocabulary and flip um, is basically accepting three arguments. We already covered flip. Uh, first is a function which takes N and uh, left-hand side and right-hand side, A and B. And then it takes two arguments and it basically flips them such that can, they can be applied to the function and gives the result. So flip is for flipping the arguments. Uh, not for flipping structures. Um, but if we combine nothing with something, then no matter what I write here, what will be the result? The result will be nothing. We know that, right? So the first uh, solution is like, we don't even, need, I don't need to type it because that will not work. Like nothing with combined with anything will produce nothing. Um, Sequence, yes. So that is something that will help us. Um, so, yeah. So sequence is the, the trick. Uh, sequence is what turns. Um, so tell me about sequence. It's sort of, um, uh, let's see. So it takes uh, an outside box with the inside box and it flips them around. It moves the inside box out 
and it takes the outside box in, right? So it's it's like this. The funny thing is uh, that that question, how we can change this into this generically, you can actually ask uh, Hugo. So you can ask Hugo um, saying, I have something, um, I have something in, um, I have, uh, you can ask like this. So, and you want to get this, right? Um, so I have um, outer context and the inner context, uh, and you want a function which converts this into into this, but I need to, I would need to write the constraints. Um, yeah, that that's not that is not working. Um, sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's easy, but sometimes it's a little bit more. Um, you need to give it a little bit more hint. Um, yeah, let's try. Let's try with the with this. So no, what was the original original question was. So we have just int or just a, and I want to say I will have just a insight, and that works. So that suggests us that sequence is what we need. So it can kind of flip the structures upside inside out. Um, well, uh, you basically need to either remember it or be able to search for it, but that is such a useful thing that we almost always use it. And sequence works on the monadic level. And then sometimes you don't want to be sequencing monads. Sometimes you just want to be sequencing uh, applicatives. And then there is a sequence A equivalent for applicative boxes, right? So if something is in the applicative, then you can uh, turn them inside out and or uh, using a sequence A. Uh, both are doing exactly the same thing, but in kind of a slightly different context. So then there is one more. And this one more is um, we have a box, outer box, which contains a number of elements in the same box type, but inside. So we have kind of a, a outer box and we have many inner boxes inside that bigger box what is the function to turn it into a single box with all those values inside? Again, uh, we can try to search for it. So let's go to Hugo and say, okay, okay, okay. Uh, let me search for it. Oh, oops. Hugo. So I have, uh, the, the easiest way to search is for, um, for um, using the example of um, lists. In, in, in this case, we're doing it for lists. Uh, so it says, okay, if you have a list of li inner lists, you can kind of uh, flatten it by concat, right? So concat is like, uh, we have the outer list with inner lists, and then it concatenates all the inside lists, flattens it out into a single list. So concat is what uh, this particular um, uh, what what you would need to turn this into this. Um, but there is one more. Um, so so this is flattening a list, right? We have uh, a list with inner lists. And we're using concat to kind of flatten it. But sometimes you have a structure which is more complicated. Uh, and in this case, we have an option or we have a maybe. And then you have kind of a nested maybes. Uh, so we have a maybe inner box within a maybe outer box. And we say, okay, uh, uh, we don't care where nothing comes or where, uh, where those maybes are coming from. We want to flatten it just to single box. Like we want to get rid of the outer layer because um, you know we we try to 
turn it inside out and, and keep it sort of, um, yeah, in a single single level. So we have two levels and we want to turn it into a single level. How can we do that? Okay, so again, we can search for it. So we can say, I have a monadic context uh, with, um, so I have an outer box and the inner box with a value. And then I want to get the box of the same type with the value, but flat without this outer box. And there is a function called join and it basically turns our tower of um, two level tower of boxes into a single single box, right? Um, so someone actually did that. Uh, someone said it is a join and it is a join. Perfect, perfect answer. Um, so join is what you need. So you learned about boxes, about level like of uh, embeddedness of boxes. You've learned uh, that concat is a very useful thing for uh, flattening a list. Uh, so just to show you a little bit of uh, a very quick example uh, with the list, uh, because list is a monad, uh, so we could flatten. Um, we could try to flatten that. Uh, so so if I do concat. I will get a flat list, right? Uh, that's what we expect. But what if I do a join? What will happen? Um, I can't really do that uh, because um, it's like it's it's not a single monadic context with the value in a monadic context. It's like that that inner thing is a it's a traversable. It's something more complicated, right? Um, uh, actually I can, uh, what, what I said is, is wrong. Let me import it. Um, uh, control. Yeah. So I, because the inside thing is a list, which is also a monad then join basically does the same thing for list as a concat, right? Um, so it, it works. It's just that I didn't have it um, imported. So join works fine um, for a list embedded inside, uh, um, lists embedded in another list. All right, I'm running out of time, so I will not ask you the questions anymore, but um, there are two more things that are sort of useful. Um, so one thing that is useful is what function given A always returns A? Well, it's an identity function, right? Uh, so ID. ID is a function which surprisingly kind of does nothing because it always returns the argument, but it's very useful for defining things in Haskell. Um, so identity function is something that you should, you should know. Um, so then uh, another one is what is a function that given two arguments always return a? Huh? You know? No? You remember? No? But similar kind of, uh, it's const. So there is a, a function, um, yeah, let me do this. Oh, come on. So const is a function which um, given two arguments always returns the first one. Again, it seems like a totally useless function, but surprisingly you will kind of uh, find uh, some uses for them. Uh, so then uh, is a monad type class a subclass of applicative? Yes, it is. So anything you can do with applicatives, you can do um, and, um, if, no, if your type is, um, um, if your type is a monad, then you can apply applicative things to it as well. Um, but not all, um, 
applicatives are monads. There are some applicatives that are not monads, right? Uh, but all monads are applicatives. Um, so the, the answer is yes. Um, okay. So there is, um, for combining things, um, there are some useful things like bind. Um, so bind uh, taking a value, normal value and a monadic function produces um, a monadic, um, monadic value. This actually is incorrect because it's missing the space. So double symbols are treated as a, as a variable, as a type variable. So if you actually want to say this B is in a box of M, you have to put space in between. So that, that thing is actually incorrect, right? Uh, but if you put the space, then you will have um, you will have it correct. So this this one is um, this one is correct. So this one is um, bind operator. Um, so we have bind, uh, we have um, return. Uh, and the question was, is um, monad type class defined by return and bind? The answer is yes. Um, and then uh, can you uh, implement monad type class just with return and join instead of bind? So can you define bind in terms of join? And the answer is yes. Um, so you should know how to how join and bind are related. So that's um, that's the um, requirement for uh, for this lecture, uh, and there is one more thing which I will show you, um, which is the fish operator. Um, so the fish operator um, it's a kind of a, a nice operator. Uh, so if you ask about fish, so a fish takes two monadic functions uh, and returns a value given a, a third argument, which is the value. So a fish operator, like the normal bind operator, you have to bind a function with the value and it produces you a monadic value. But fish allows you to combine multiple monadic functions and then give it a value and then have a chain done. So it's for composing, uh, monadic structures into kind of a sequential flow, right? Um, so the fish sometimes it's better to you to be used rather than bind because it makes the, the syntax kind of a nicer. All right, so that's all for today. Uh, apologies, I went over time a bit. Um, that's, yeah. Um, and that's all. Questions? All right, so we'll see you at 2.15 for labs, those of you who want to get the labs checked. Thank you, remote people.